thank you for coming out on a rainy day to our first Spectrum lecture um, of the academic year. And we are very lucky this evening, or this afternoon, actually, to have Dr. De Rosier to talk. He actually has a BS in chemistry from Boston College in, from 1978, and his PhD in inorganic chemistry from the University of California at Santa Barbara that he earned in 1983. He subsequently worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Argonne National Laboratory. Since 1986, he's worked as a research chemist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, otherwise known as NIST. He's a member of the Radiation Physics Division, and his research focuses on radiation metrology and the development of standards and services. In particular, his activities include radiation accident dosimetry, clinical radiology, and industrial radiation processing. He is an author of more than 100 publications and has received numerous awards. We're especially happy to have him today because you may be aware, if you have been watching anything on TV, that the government is closed and NIST, as a result, has been um, closed. They can't check email, they can't answer phones. So he's here um, on his own personal time volunteering. Um, he's not representing NIST, but he is sharing science with you. So please do welcome him out of um, his vacation from the work and please join me in welcoming him. He's going to talk, I forgot to say the title, about radiation forensics of human exposures. Please welcome our speaker. So I uh, cover several topics. We're going to cover uh, actually a broad spectrum of science from physics, chemistry, biochemistry, uh, uh, basically just about every topic will be covered in some form uh, during this talk. Um, so it's, uh, I think it should be good for uh, anyone from uh, any background. And there's basically three sections. What is ionizing radiation? Give you an introduction to that and why is it important to study radiation accidents and, and how do we do it? How do we measure uh, radiation exposures in, in human tissues? And my introduction to radiation was when I was a kid. I used to uh, always watch all these sci-fi movies. Uh, yeah, they're in black and white. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. You want to check this? Maybe I switched it off. Okay. Uh, did you pick it up now? Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, what I used to, there's an introduction to radiation effects. So you can, uh, radiation exposures here can make you very small, can have you grow into giant men and or women. And the, one of my favorites was the amazing Colossal Man, uh, who was exposed in a radiation accident, or in a radiation, uh, I'm sorry, an atomic bomb test. And I mean, these things used to really happen. People used to line up to watch these things uh, back in, in those days. And um, this part is fiction, though. This is the, the amazing colossal man after his exposure. But when we talk about radiation, there, uh, here's the full spectrum of radiation from radio waves, up through visible light, you can going up in energy to the left here, or you, the same scale here, uh, up in energy as you go up. Uh, and when we talk about ionizing radiation, these are higher energy than your, the visible and the UV. We get into the X-rays, and then even higher than that are gamma rays. And so what is ionization? So ionization results from the absorption of energy into a, uh, into a nucleus and with the ejection of an electron. And you form uh, positive ions and negative ions. And there are different types of radiation, basically different particles. Uh, alpha particles are, are very large and you can see here are stopped by a, a small um, you know, by a piece of paper, basically. They, they, they can't uh, go uh, penetrate further than that. Uh, beta particles are, uh, are basically electrons, uh, and they have a, a greater penetration. And then photons, x-rays and gamma rays are photons, and they penetrate uh, deeper into materials depending on their uh, energy. 
And the difference between gamma rays and X-ray photons are based on their, uh, what their source is, how they originate. And the unit of measurement is a gray. That's the uh, international unit of measure. You probably heard about rads. Uh, you may hear people say millirads, and, and you hear that term. Um, the unit we use is the, the gray. Apparently in the future, we will be going back to rads because uh, if on Star Trek, they use that unit. Um, so the, uh, you can be prepared for that. But the, the difference between uh, radiation, um, basically radioactivity and what I'm going to be doing, uh, radiation dose, um, is since you're all students, I thought I'd put this in terms of pizza. Uh, is basically, this, this heat lamp is, would be a, like a radiation source. It's emitting radiation, whereas uh, the, the pizza absorbs that energy, and that's what I'm concerned about, is, not, is the absorption of energy, not basically how much is emitted. So the radioactivity is like the lamp, and then the dosimetry involves how much of that is absorbed by whatever material is, the, is, is of concern. And so how is radiation used? Uh, radiation is, is used in many ways. You know, if you have a broken uh, leg, you go to the doctor, you get an x-ray, or your teeth get x-rayed for diagnostics. Um, and there's uh, multiple other radiation applications in medical diagnostics. Uh, cancer therapy is one of the most effective, uh, radiation is one of the most uh, effective ways to uh, treat cancers. Certain cancers are um, you can get up to 90, over 95% uh, 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 cure from certain radiation treatments. Um, would surprise you to learn that all of blood that's used in transfusions in hospitals are treated with ionizing radiation. It kills a certain factor uh, that is... Uh, uh, lethal to a very small percentage of the population, and, and rather than uh, than test people, they just bulk irradiate the blood. Um, and uh, I'm the, I'm actually involved in doing the calibrations for the hospitals. Uh, and then, as you go, and and actually, as I'm talking here in, in these different applications, we're actually going up higher in energy uh, for for many of these. So those are all pretty low dose applications. Um, when you get up, there's, you can treat, use ionizing radiation to uh, preserve foods. It kills the bacteria, uh, microorganisms that are in foods, and helps with the, the preservation of food. Um, it's used, very widely used in a lot of countries, not so much in the United States, but uh, in, in many other countries where food preservation uh, is an issue. So it's just like you get your hand x-rayed, the radiation passes through. It's your, the food isn't radioactive, it just kills the, the bacteria that are, that are present. Um, medical device sterilization, about 50% of all medical devices are sterilized with ionizing radiation. I'll show you a radiation uh, processing plant that does this sort of stuff, but it enables a processor to package everything, put it in a box, and ship it to a processing plant, and irradiate it, and kill all the bacteria in its packaging uh, and, and then have it be able to be used in the hospital. Um, I should mention, when I talk about food, uh, we're not sterilizing the food. You're just reducing the, the bacterial load. But medical device sterilization, is, uh, um, they, it does have to have a certain sterility level. Um, polymer cross-linking. Many uh, polymer, uh, polymeric materials like cable insulation, things like that, a lot of plastic wrap is used. Those are all treated with radiation, and those strands of polymers, they cross-link. The radiation uh, makes free radicals, and they cross-link uh, and make the product stronger. Um, I, I show this one here, this malaria vaccine production, because it's a local thing, and it was actually in the news very recently. Uh, There's a company called Scenaria. I think I have it on the next slide. Yeah. So there's a company called Scenaria. Scenaria... Um, is trying to develop a malaria vaccine. Uh, malaria means bad air, and scenario means clean air. And the way they're doing it is, with, uh, is by taking mosquitoes, allowing them to feed on 
uh, blood that has the malaria parasite. And then they actually irradiate the mosquitoes to a certain uh, dose level with gamma rays. It doesn't kill the mosquito, and it doesn't kill the parasite, but it, it attenuates the parasite such that it's, it doesn't cause illness. And then they uh, isolate the parasite and make it into a vaccine that they inject into people. And it's in its, uh, I think, second round of clinical trials. Um, and it was just a big news release because it was uh, the most effective um, malaria vaccine to, uh, to date. Um, oh. So I told you about radiation processing plants. Um, this is sort of, of cutaway, uh, and this is kind of what I told you before about how packages can be, pro um, uh, I'm sorry, products can be packaged and then uh, sent to a radiation processing plant. The, uh, they are then, uh, you know, put on these large totes and they enter into the radiation room uh, via a maze that's uh, sh heavily shielded with concrete. The radiation source is a rack uh, of cobalt-60 in, um, in this case, and it re resides for um, when not in use in a pool of water and raised up when, to when the products are in that room to be uh, treated. This is a picture of a rack of cobalt-60 that I actually took with my camera in a facility. And, and the depth of the water is set so that it's safe to stand where you are. The water absorbs the, the radiation. And what you see here is uh, UV light. And it's, called, it's actually called Cherenkov radiation. And that's uh, when the, the high energy, those gamma rays are being absorbed by the water. They're slowing down. They're losing energy, and as they lose energy, they generate heat, but they also uh, give off light, and it's a more of a, in the UV end of things, so it's a little bluish. Um, this actually comes into play in uh, one of the radiation accidents, so I, I want you to see um, sort of this, uh, these glowing rods. So they wouldn't glow in air. If I pull this up, if this was pulled up from, it's only glowing because it's the, the, the photons are being absorbed by the water, and the light is, is, is being given off. This is an electron beam processing plant. I'm also going to talk about an accident related to that. Uh, and in this case, there's no radioactive materials. Uh, it's like an X-ray machine. An X-ray machine doesn't have a, any radioactive materials in it. Um, and it, it accelerates electrons to near the speed of light, and so they end up having a very high energy, and uh, it works the same way as, um, as gamma rays, but it, it without their radiation source. Um, but there are, like you saw in that earlier slide, that the penetration, the depth of penetration, the radiation is of, uh, you know, electrons versus photons is different, so it, it uh, has different applications. And this is a this is an electron beam accelerator here. Here's the part that accelerates the electrons. This is called a scan horn. You can see it here. That's the accelerator would be above this. And it's a, it's a beam of radiation, just like this uh, laser pointer. And it scans back and forth as the products go through it. And uh, it's just on a, on a conveyor belt, as you can see here. In this case, actually, so again, I talked about the depth of penetration. You notice there's actually an accelerator underneath. And so they hit it from the top with this accelerator, then from the bottom with this accelerator, and you get an even distribution of the radiation dose. So again, why, so why are we interested in studying radiation accidents? Well, there are, you know, we, we are exposed to radiation from, you know, for, for certain treatments, like I told you before. Also, as in those processing plants, or even the, the dental technician that takes your x-ray, uh, they have an occupational exposure. So we have to set limits on what's the safe, uh, the safe level of radiation that these people can be exposed to. And the information that we use now for, uh, to set these levels is all based on studies from the A-bomb uh, exposures at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
there was very large scale uh, studies of the survivors of the, um, of the population, the exposed populations. So get into some chemistry and biochemistry and physics, basically a mix of these things. Um, your, your chromosomes are made up of DNA and a lot of the radiation effects are caused by uh, damage to the DNA. So if you look at, here's a DNA molecule here, and uh, this is, as this is a, say, a radiation impinging on or in directing, being directed towards this DNA molecule. Uh, here's a scale here, if you like. But the, uh, the radiation comes in and interacts with the water. And it's, like I told you, just like in that uh, picture I showed you of the glowing rods, the radiation is being absorbed by the water. And it's, it's bouncing off these water molecules, losing energy as it traverses through. And it branches out into, um, actually, if you want to come up later on, I have a, just a, it's a little, you can't see it from there, but you can come up and look at it. It's a sort of a tree-like structure that was made with an electron beam. But uh, it shows you sort of the, uh, the pattern of, of this, of the, of the uh, translation of the, the radiation going through material. And, and the interaction, it, there can be direct interaction of radiation from the outside, we'll say, with my DNA and my cells. But the majority of the damage is not caused by uh, direct radiation effect, but by free radicals that are created in the water. It's water-free radicals that chemically react with the DNA. So it's, it's more, when you're talking about radiation effects, it's actually more chemistry and biochemistry than it is of uh, the physics. And we have to assess risk. I told you we want to know what the safe levels are. So this is not real data. This is an, my artist's representation of, of, the, of the data. But so here we have the health risk. So say this could be an increase in a certain cancer versus on the x-axis dose. So as we increase dose, they found, say, in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, studies, they found that there's a linear increase with the dose. Uh, so the more dose, the more uh, of a type of cancer that was um, found in people. But we all work and live in this area. This, this was a very large acute exposure, but workers have a chronic exposure at very low doses. And this part of the graph is all assumed. It's, there's, they try to measure as much as they can, as low as they can, but it's basically they assume the linear uh, model that says we'll just draw a straight line through this data and we'll say at, you know, this is the risk level. But it's very possible that there could be some quarter and threshold up here, whereas uh, either it's, you know, at very low doses, say there's a, a, a greater risk and then it kind of levels off. Or the opposite could be. Uh, could occur, whereas at very low doses, it doesn't really matter what we get until we hit a certain barrier, and then it, then it jumps up. And then you have this uh, case here where it's called radiation hormesis, where some people postulate, and there's actually measurements that support this, um, at very low doses, there's a benefit. That's why this is negative risk here. And it makes sense. Just like in the vaccine case, you get a little bit of uh, of, of some uh, virus, or in that case, uh, the malaria parasite, and your body develops a defense against that uh, intruder. And in this case, your body is developing, by the low radiation exposure that we normally get, and we get it from the, the building materials, a lot of radio radioactive isotopes are in our bodies. Uh, we have cosmic rays that we're exposed to. So we actually do get about a milligray per year uh, at sea level, and your body, uh, uh, you, the radiation exposure causes chemical changes in your cells, and your body needs to have repair mechanisms the, all the time. So the, because of this 
constant radiation exposure. So uh, there are chemical changes, your body recognizes it and makes the repair and fixes it. Uh, and, and so it's thought that this, these low levels of radiation stimulate the, these mechanisms within our body and that's why there would be a benefit at very low doses. So, in bio, so when we're talking about how, making the measurements, biodissymmetry, and, and if you notice, if you go into the, get your uh, dental x-rays, the, the person might have a, a badge uh, with their name on it, but that badge is actually probably a radiation detector, uh, and there it's used to monitor their exposure uh, in the workplace, and they're usually uh, depending on their exposure level, they're, they're kept for a little while and then sent off to a company and they make measurements and they, they keep track of people's radiation exposures. But all, none of us here carry uh, radiation dosimeters. So if there was some kind of uh, accidental exposure or terrorist attack, something like that, uh, you would, uh, we would have to find another way to make these measurements. Um, so we need to f identify some kind of material either that we're carrying with us or some tissue from our body. Uh, it's known that you can measure chromosomal damage. Uh, you can, so you could take a blood sample and, and actually measure radiation damage. The problem with that is, as I told you, we all have uh, repair mechanisms. And some of our repair mechanisms are better than others uh, between from person to person. So the same amount of chromosomal damage is not a hard measurement of the actual uh, radiation exposure. And they're also, um, they're not permanent. So they, they, you, time is a factor in the measurement. Um, and in this case, I'm going to tell you about mineralized tissues. So teeth and bone, which are actually uh, more of a physical detector. So in bone, uh, it's, bone is about, uh, is about, I think, well, it depends on what type of bone. There's different types of bones. We're going to be up to like 60% mineral. Um, but it's, it's, it's made up of collagen, organic material, and then uh, hydroxyapatite, which is, a mineral, uh, is the mineral uh, tissue uh, that's uh, present in your body that gives the bone its strength. And so here's a... Uh, uh, here's hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphate, is the, the basic repeating unit uh, in here. And these are, these are the phosphate groups with uh, calcium spliced in. But as the bone grows, it incorporates a lot of impurities. And it, as it turns out, carbonate uh, is, a, is the, uh, the, one of the uh, most common impurities. And it occurs in bone up to about 5%. Uh, here you, is actually, you can see there's a difference here in this structure. Uh, there's actually, in this picture, there's a carbonate uh, molecule stuck in between uh, this, these phosphate groups. And it's just an, it just naturally happens. You have carbonate in your blood as the bo bone's forming, picks up phosphate and carbonate, and it, it's just incorporated into there. But in this case, it works to our advantage. Um, I told you about ionizations, uh, so the ionizations occur in the bone and uh, electrons are ejected and, and free radicals are formed. Free radicals are uh, molecules with unpaired electrons. And this technique, electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, also known as electron spin resonance spectroscopy, uh, measures unpaired electrons. So if you have, in, in normally electrons are paired when you eject an electron, now you have an unpaired electron, and we can put that material with the unpaired electrons in a magnetic field, this is a large electromagnet, and then apply microwaves to it, and we can flip the spin. So the electron's like a little spinning top, and we hit it with microwaves, and the spin flips. This is the, more the physical diagram from it. So H is a magnetic field, in the absence of magnetic field, the, the electron can be spin up or spin down. It doesn't really matter. It's unpaired. If they were paired and you flipped one, the other one would have to flip. But if they're unpaired, they can be spin up or spin down. But as you increase the magnetic field, this, 
the electrons that are spinning in the same direction as the field align with the field, and it becomes a lower energy state. This is, and then if you want to spin against the field, it, uh, it takes energy. And that energy is microwaves. So that's, it turns out that that energy gap is, is microwaves. So if we hit it, if we take the unpaired electrons, put it in a magnetic field, hit it with microwaves, we can flip the spin, and that ab energy absorbed can give us a measure of how many electrons, unpaired electrons, are in there. And I told you those unpaired electrons were caused by radiation. So we can equate all of that to, that's our radiation measurement. Uh, this sort of blow up of the crystal, I told you these are like the phosphate groups, and we have carbonate in there. And then, so what happens, the, the electrons that are ejected uh, from the ionization get trapped by the carbonate. So this, it's, it's just so happening, it's just pure s luck, serendipity, that this, uh, this impurity carbonate will trap these electrons and it's very stable. Most free radicals, they're nanoseconds, microseconds, seconds if you're lucky, they last. But in this case, in bone, in this mineralized tissue, the lifetime of this free radical is 10 to the 6 years. It's actually used in archaeological dating. So um, if I put this piece of bone that's been irradiated in my spectrometer, I will measure this spectrum. And this sort of spectral shape, this signature, tells me that's a carbonate radical. It, it tells me the type of radical. And then this measurement here of the peak will tells me how much is in there. So that's the, that's the, the measurement of, of um, irradiated hydroxyapatite or bone tissue. So how do I turn that into, how do I quantify that? So if I take a piece of bone that's been from a radiation accident, I put it in my spectrometer, I make a measurement, then I take that piece of bone and take it to my radiation source in my building that's calibrated, I know exactly what it's giving out, and I give it another dose. And then I make another measurement, and I just repeat that. Another dose, another measurement, another dose, another measurement. It's a, called the standard addition method. It's a very common analytical technique. Now I have the, the response with, of, of, this, of the radicals that are uh, or the material versus the radiation dose. If I just draw a straight line through that and back extrapolate to the negative dose axis, it gives me my dose. And so I don't even have to calibrate the material, I can take a bone from one person, the bone from another person, and it's basically self-calibrating. So if this line is a different slope for a different piece of bone, I, uh, it will correct itself. So how did, I, how did I use that? Well, I was doing food irradiation. It was one of my uh, projects. We were trying to use this technique. If food was irradiated in some other country and then imported in the United States, could I make a measurement? So we say, you know, I was working with chicken bones and fish bones and things like that and making these measurements. And then one day, someone from the radiation, this uh, emergency uh, team out of Oak Ridge uh, called me up and said, I see your publications on, on irradiated bone and dosimetry measurements. Can it be done on, on human bones? And I said, uh, yeah, it can be done on, on, on anything. And in fact, it had been tried before in a radiation accident in the 60s, but it was a, it was a mixed field of, of gamma and neutrons, and so it wasn't possible to recreate the dosimetry like I did here. So this was really the kind of the, one of the first opportunities to do something like this. Um, and this accident happened in San Salvador. Um, it was a radiation processing facility that was there. It was installed by a Canadian company. Um, and it was, the problem was there was civil war that was going on then. Um, all of the people that were originally trained by the Canadian company, they, uh, they left. And they trained other people that came in, but it was almost like a word of mouth on how to operate the facility. Uh, and then as things went into disrepair, well, there was no money or mechanism to, um, uh, to fix these things. 
So this is a cutaway of that radiation processing plant. It's a little bit different than those other plants. Things went around on a rail, very mechanized. Um, in this case, these boxes were pushed through this maze. And once they entered into this uh, area where the radiation, uh, uh, the irradiation of the products and sterilization of the products occurred, they were pushed by pistons. So they were just the boxes were moved, shuttled uh, along and around the source up into different, there was two stages, and uh, they were pushed around and then pushed out by pistons. Um, so actually, I didn't mention that um, the, there's going to be some pretty gruesome pictures uh, in this from these radiation accidents, and then and I have had people uh, pass out before. So um, it's okay if one of your neighbors is sleeping. During this talk, just make sure that they're breathing and they didn't, they didn't pass out. Okay. Um, so this is now, this is a slice. We were looking at sort of a top view before, but now this is a cutaway slice of the radiation facility. The radiation source is in the, is in the water here and it's raised up into the room for the irradiations. I just wanted to point out that there were many, many different safety devices that were present. Uh, I mean, there's, there's switches uh, if the source is up or down to lock the doors. Uh, there's an audible alarm. There's another sensor that's in the room that if the source was up, it would not allow you to open the door. But all of these were broken. All of these were broken or bypassed in some way so that they could operate the facility uh, without the safety devices. And, and that is the case for uh, in the United States, I mean, these facilities operate all over the United States for, for medical device companies, and uh, they're, they're, they're very safe. In this case, so here's another example of the problem. This is the control panel to operate it, and there's no labels on the buttons. So it's just, again, it's just, it's just word of mouth. Um, in case I forget to mention it, uh, they, um, what was it? Uh, well, I've already forgot to mention. It. Uh, to mention, um, what was I going to say? The the uh, well, I'll get to it, I guess. Okay. So again, the problem. This is how they got in and out of the room. If they wanted to go in, they take a metal. They they would trip the lock on the door and open it up. Oh, and now I know what I was going to say. They thought that when uh, the button, that button turned off the radiation. So they thought it was like an x-ray machine. When you press off, the radiation was off. And when you press on, the radiation's on. They didn't really understand, the workers didn't really understand how, the, how it worked. Here's a, an example of the box. As you can see, from being pushed around and used over and over again, the cardboard degraded. And then they would tape it up and use it. Um, uh, and, and this actually contributed to the problem. So in that room. The, the boxes were being pushed around, and what happened is they, they became so flimsy that, um, I can't remember what the number is, but let's say four boxes got jammed into a space that should have only had three. And, and that rack of, of cobalt-60 that comes up out of the, the water, there's a, sort of a metal screen or guide in front uh, to not allow the boxes to hit the, the rack of, of radioactive material. But when those boxes got jammed by the pistons, it bent the metal rack and, and uh, at that screen, and that rack of cobalt-60 got jammed. So the workers said, so, OK, we'll just turn it off, uh, and we'll go in and uh, we'll free it. So this is a, there's a cable that comes up from the top that, um, that moves the source up and down. And there are three people that went in to, uh, to free this. Um, rack from the from being jammed, and uh, just like I told you before, you can see it's glowing if it's in the water, but it's not glowing if it's outside. So there was no, in that sense, it didn't really warn them. And again, they thought the radiation was off. Um, they went, they they ended up feeling sick, and they went to the hospital like a day or so later, and they didn't report the accident because they didn't know they were exposed. And they didn't report that there was a problem. And so they were treated for food poisoning, because they had nausea 
etc. And then it happened again. It got jammed. Things got jammed up. Uh, somehow they freed it without going in there. But the, now the cobalt rods fell off the rack and into the bottom of the pool. So this is a picture from up, up above of the glowing rods uh, that fell. And, they, and when that happened, they said, oh, yeah, that happened the other day, and we uh, freed it. Um, but these, they got rather severe uh, radiation damage uh, to their tissue. And here's some pictures from the, uh, from the people that were exposed. So what, what's happening here? They had a very high dose of radiation pass through their living tissue and it causes damage to the, to the tissue. Uh, your, eventually, the, the doses that they got were very high uh, and the, the, um, the, t- the tissue degrades, non-functional. You don't get blood flow. So the tissue starts to die, and it's just like a gangrene uh, type effect. Uh, the bones, as I mentioned earlier, was sent to me, uh, and I took these bones. Uh, I, <clears throat> I asked that there be no flesh. Um, I, they gave me the bones, put them in this, uh, the tube, and put them in my spectrometer, like I told you before, inside the magnetic field. Um, here's the spectrometer in my lab. Microwaves are applied, and um, they uh, uh, and I can make the measurements as I've done before. So I have a little note to myself because I always forget. Um, so it, there are some amusing stories on this, so I, I'm not trying to make light of, wh- of what happened, but it was kind of funny because they 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 wanted to, and this is uh, back in the in the well, it, for me it was around 1990, and they, um, the, the, the REACTS, the Radiation Emergency Team said, you know, you can ship the leg to us because they were going to take the tissue and make measurements in Oak Ridge and send me the bone. Um, but the doctor said, no, it's okay. I was gonna, I'm taking my family to the United States for uh, Disney World. And so we'll just they we took it with us. So they, they came through customs with a leg in a box. You know, so it's kind of something you wouldn't be able to do today. Um, so, talking about measurements. So, five gray is a lethal dose of radiation. And this are the, these are the, the actual spectra that I measured from those bone samples. In this case, this is the, the one person that was closest to the source. So, I'm going to say five gray is something called LD50, lethal dose to 50% of the population. So, again, go back to what I told you before about how we all have... Uh, some people have different defense mechanisms than others. And so the LD50 is that, so if everyone here uh, was exposed to five gray radiation, whole body radiation, uh, then basically 50%, this side of the room would die and the other side would live. Sorry, sorry, to, sorry about that. Uh, pick your seat better next time. Um, the, so it's just... It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a statistical sort of average. Um, but as you can see, the foot, the, the foot area, uh, the, the toe bones uh, that I measured in the, and in the foot got 70 gray. So over 10 times the lethal dose. That's why you saw such serious damage uh, to that. And it was directional. So he, the, the, the source was um, at the, basically at his foot level. And you can see that the dose drops off uh, as it goes up um, to. But he had, um, this person did not survive. They had a lot of other medical complications too. Um, They actually made errors in the hospital with him too and um, didn't survive. uh, Each of these two people lost a leg. I made measurements on this person too. And you can see it's um, a lower dose. Um, and this person did survive. Uh, the third person uh, was far enough away that although they did get a significant dose, they, there was no um, need to, uh, to amputate. So there was another accident. I told you this uh, radiation accident, uh, accelerator-based radiation accident, and it happened in Gaithersburg. Uh, it did not happen at NIST. 
Okay, so don't, I just want to make that very clear so you don't walk away saying, yeah, this guy was NIST, it was an accident. Yeah, gate this work. No. Um, so it was added, there was uh, actually by the DMV, I don't know if it's still in operation or not, but um, told you they are, in, radiate plastics. In this case, they're radiating Teflon, scrap Teflon. And if you radiate it to a very, very high dose, it, it does the opposite of the cross-linking at a certain level dose. You break it up into such some, those polymers, strands of molecules, into such small pieces every time you, you, it absorbs radiation, it breaks bonds, that it becomes brittle. Uh, and uh, you can crush it into a powder. So they're able to take scrap Teflon and turn it into powdered Teflon that are then used in other applications. Um, so this is, again, the case where um, safety features were there or were available but were not used. Um, and, um, and in this case, it's, it was the state of Maryland that oversaw the facility. It's not a federal, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, uh, oversees the use of radioactive materials, but this is a machine base. And so uh, each state has their own rules. Uh, I'll, in case I forget to mention, the rules were changed after this accident, uh, but it didn't change what happened here. And uh, we wrote a publication on that, and it was in the, this issue of health physics. Um, I actually have the issue here if somebody wants to take a look at it. But, um, yeah. So, uh, the, again, this is a machine base. So, it's a, up above here. This is not the source that was there. I'll use the pictures. But, again, there's radiation coming uh, d very directional, a beam coming down and irradiating products. Um, and uh, they, they just pass in and around on a conveyor system. So, this is the design of the facility. Here's the radiation source, the horn that you saw, if you're looking down um, uh, at the horn. And as you can see, just like on the other facilities, there's a maze uh, to, and that's shielded, heavily shielded uh, maze. And then there's a, a control room out here that runs the accelerator. And the products travel around on a rail system and uh, under the beam to get treated. So these are things not to do if you work in a facility like this. Uh, this is a recreation of the event uh, by a person that was working in my laboratory at the time and basically showed you what that, that worker did. So what happened was uh, the, one of the, the big problems was the, the person, the health physicist, that did all the safety evaluations for that facility also was employed by that facility, okay? And since he worked there all the time, um, you know, he knew what he was doing. And so uh, there were times when there was a problem with the accelerator, uh, and he would turn, he would not turn the accelerator off, but he would turn the current down. So it's basically, you know, your TV is on, but the volume's down. So it's still on, it's still generating electricity, heat, or whatever, but you can't hear it. And in this case, the, the, there was, the accelerator wasn't running full blast, but there was still some beam coming out. And I, I showed you a picture of the, the this product rails, and I told you they ran underneath it. There were, there were light beams uh, that ran at a certain height so that if, uh, if, say, for example, the box got flipped up by accident, it wouldn't bang into the, to the electron beam horn. Uh, so if, if the, a box were to break that light beam, the machine would shut off. And so he didn't, he, I don't know, the, the, the health physicist wanted to check something in there, and he would turn down the current, leave the machine on, walk under the beams and into that maze, but he knew enough not to go and up to the area where the radiation was coming out. Maybe he was checking something else. Um, but this other younger person that was working there, hadn't been trained that long, uh, would see him do this and thought, well, oh, I guess you can do that. Just turn it down and you can go in. 
And one night he was working there and he was working alone and they were, they were running uh, very late into the evening and there was a problem with the beam. And he thought that, well, you know, um, I'll save time. I won't have to get it started up again. I'll just turn the current down and I'll go in and I'll take a look. So he turns the current down and, and he goes and walks under the beams, uh, those, those safety light beams, and he walks around to, to where the, and through the maze to where the scan horn is. And he, he was thinking, um, I should tell you, at the bottom of that scan horn is a very, very thin piece of metal. So the, acceler the electrons are accelerated under vacuum, and that metal holds the vacuum. And the electrons can, are very high energy, so they can pass through that thin metal window. And he thought, well, maybe there's a piece of metal that's protruding, getting heated up by the radiation and causing the metal to expand, and I'm losing, and losing vacuum. And so he went and he put his hands under the beam and then thought he would take a look. And that was very brief, fortunately. Although also, fortunately, he had glasses, so that, uh, that stopped a lot of the radiation. Uh, and then he, he did his job, and, and he went home. Um, so the next morning, after next day after he uh, woke up, uh, took a shower, and he felt kind of tingly, like you would if you had like a sunburn, something like that. And he thought, well, I must have scalded myself uh, in the shower. Uh, maybe the, the water was too hot. But this, he had radiation damage from this ser very serious radiation damage. Fortunately, the beam is very directional. Uh, well, for not fortunately for every part of him, but his whole, his body didn't get uh, serious exposure just when he looked and his toes from his, from his feet being at the, uh, below the beam. Uh, but over time, the, again, the, this, this doesn't uh, manifest itself immediately. Uh, the, the tissue is degrading over time. And he ended up having to lose. Uh, he lost um, all of his fingers. So you can see it's very directional. This is a line, basically, uh, where the, the, the serious exposure occurred uh, versus the healthy tissue. Uh, and we received uh, these bone fragments from the, from the radiation exp um, from the hospital, and uh, we made measurements. And you can see it. The highest dose of the fingertip was 108 gray that I measured. So it's the again a lethal dose is five gray. So in this case, it's more academic uh, what the dose was. It's it's a it's a uh, it was it was more of interest to the for the medical treatment. Um, after these measurements occurred, basically the surgeon knew that yeah there was no hope for these fingers. That that the dose was way too high. They made the right decision to uh, to amputate. Well, um, to lighten things up a bit, there was a previous accident. They're not serious like this one, but um, I'll give you the punchline up front. But I told you that this, fa this facility was out there in Gaithersburg and that the, the, the accelerator is vertically mounted. So if you were to look at the building, it's very flat roof, and then there's a tower where the accelerator is. Well, the tiles in a windstorm blew off of... Uh, the, the roof tiles blew off this tower section, and there was a hole there. And so you call the roofer. And the roofer says, well, okay, I'll come over and I'll fix it. I'll be there between 9 and 12. So they're running a business here, and it's 12 o'clock, and the guy is not there. So I was like, all right, he's probably not coming. So let's just crank up the machine and get it going. So the roofer drives up and pulls up up front, he looks up there, oh yeah, there's, there, there's the hole. Throws his ladder up uh, there and climbs up and takes a look at the hole in, the, in that section of the roof. And it's big enough to crawl into. So he goes inside. So now he's in the room where the accelerator is. The radiation's coming out of the bottom. So it's just the, this big piece of machinery that... Um, you know, that, that's accelerating the electrons and, the, and, and to, 
and they're coming out the bottom. So it's like, okay, well, okay, well, I'll go down and tell the people that I'm here. Oh, well, there's a, a door in the floor here. So he opens up the he opens up the door and climbs down the ladder. Fortunately, he comes out right here on the other side of where the radiation is. And he can go in either direction. 50-50 chance. And he went this way. And he walked around and there's these guys sitting in the control room. Just, you know, this thing, this thing runs and, you know, they put their feet up on the desk and it's, it's very loud. These, all, these, uh, this particular type of accelerator this is a very loud hum. Uh, and, and, and when they get, I've, I've worked with acceler these type of accelerators before and we've had, you know, emergency shutoff tests. Um, a lot of these operate where there's even a cord around the room. If you got locked in the room, you could pull the cord and shut it off yourself uh, if you heard it start up. So, uh, you know, it's very loud and I've heard them shut down and it's just a, like a big boom. So these guys are just sitting there, they get it cranked up and then everything's running and all of a sudden, boom, a guy walks out. Because he tripped the light beam and, and the, this guy walks out of the radiation source area. Um, fortunately, uh, he didn't get, oh, let's go to the next section. Fortunately, he didn't get, um, a uh, serious exposure, they did all kinds of calculations, and because he was in that shielded area the whole time and spent very little time uh, walking through there, uh, he got a, actually got a very low dose. Um, so I mentioned uh, mineralized tissue. Uh, as it turns out that, oh, by the way, am I running over time? Or? Okay, well I'm gonna zip through this then. So mineralized tissue, uh, enamel is, is 98% mineral. It's the only tissue in your body that's non-living tissue. And it's the best radiation detector. And it's what was used for a lot of radiation measurements um, in, uh, in a lot of these accidents, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, teeth were never removed just to measure. The you, people who were exposed in these accidents, when they went for uh, medical treatment, if the tooth had to be removed, the tooth was sent to a registry. Um, here's a sort of micrograph of uh, hydroxyapatite. It was, uh, these measurements were used in the Chernobyl accident where that, uh, this uh, reactor blew up and exposed a large population. This is a global view, by the way, of the distribution of the radiation cloud from the North Pole. There was uh, this, this uh, other exposures that have occurred in time is a MIAC, is a, a nuclear weapons facility in Russia. And they would routinely dump radioactive waste in the water. And it would go downstream and people use the water to drink, irrigate their, their farms, uh, wash their clothes. Um, and basically, after people, after these deformities were, were kind of showing up and people were dying, they um, moved, they evacuated a whole series of towns. They stopped dumping into the river. And then they would dump into this pond that was near them, but then sometimes dry season, it would, dry, it would dry out, and then the wind would blow. I mean, these are plumes of radioactive material. It's a, it's a very, very polluted part of Russia. Um, and the people there, like I said, told you they drank the you know, water with radioactive material in it, and it actually got incorporated uh, into their tissue. This is a tooth that we measured, and we took, it's a, different type of measurement where we could actually map out the distribution of the radioactive material in the tooth. Uh, it's, the, since this part of the tooth is living, there's blood flow into the tooth, it incorporates the radioactive material and um, you can have, make, also make dose measurements from that. Um, there was also measurements made on exposed populations in um, Kazakhstan. Semipolitinsk was a uh, area where the Russians would explode uh, most of their uh, nuclear bombs and tests. And there's very good maps, actually, of, of the, the radiation plumes. Uh, and there's many towns that people that were exposed. Uh, the, the, the government there 
uh, stored a lot of the teeth after people passed away. Um, and this is a NIH study that I participated in. I made the tooth measurements. And these are all the different towns in that area. And we made uh, measurements. So the way that they, I didn't mention earlier, the way that you, you measure this risk is you look at populations that were exposed to radiation, measure the dose, look at a population, similar population maybe in your, hopefully in your country or in the same region that was not exposed to radiation, and then look at the incidence of, of cancers, certain cancers in this population versus this population. So these are em epidemiologists that take this data and convert it into um, uh, assess the risk uh, for this. And I'm working with, uh, so, uh, it's my last slide, working with the um, Dartmouth College. There's some people there that are trying to develop methods to use this technique to measure the population, normal population here. If there was ever a, a nuclear incident and people were exposed, they could, uh, they're developing a device where if you pu could put your head up against a magnet and again to sort of al again align these spins and then with this uh, loop here introduce um, microwaves you can actually make the measurements on a living tooth and so their their idea is to develop these uh, devices that they could set up in portable tents and that if people were exposed they come through and then they could do a triage and sort you know who was exposed and who wasn't uh, so really, the only way to do it now is by the uh, by nausea. Is the, the, if you vomit, the, the, it's, it, you might be exposed. But if a nuclear bomb were to go off in DC, I think a lot of unexposed people would also have the same reaction. So it's not the most analytical way of, of telling what your dose is. So um, it, uh, it's a, it, hopefully this is an emergency procedure that will be available at some point. Uh, and hopefully never used, but uh, would be there to be able to tell people you should seek treatment and, and you're okay. So again, this side of the room seeks treatment, you guys are good. So, um, but anyway, again, all these facilities operate very safely all the time and these, these incidents are very f few and far between. So I don't want to give you the impression that uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of problems. But uh, these things happen, and when they do, they, uh, they called me. Uh, thank you very much. I promised a lot of people that um, we would wrap up in an hour. So I think what we'll do is ask people that have questions to come up and ask your questions rather than field questions now when some people have buses to catch or classes to go to. So if you would, please come up with your questions, um, and which you would thank me, thank again our speaker for uh, Fascinating talk.